Hello, my friends. Welcome to my corner. Back in the day, there was a book that in Spain and Latin America was inescapable. I am talking about Juan Ramón Jiménez's Platero y Show. Everyone, and, and I mean everyone, had read it. It was basically on the same shelf as The Little Prince, Damien by Hermann Hesse, and also something like Jonathan Livingston Siegel. All of those books. You know the kind of book that I am talking about. So it was really, really popular. It was a beloved book. I read it many, many years ago as a young adult, and this was my copy. I got it at Borders. Do you guys remember Borders? So I got it there for $3.50, if you can believe that, this original copy in Spanish. But then a few weeks ago, I was at a local library with my girlfriend, and we found, just lying there in a place where it was not supposed to be, this copy, and it's a dual language edition. So I was like, what a wonderful excuse to read this book again and check out the English version. So that's what I decided to do. So before we look at the book, let me give you, as I usually do, some information about the author. So we are looking at Juan Ramón Jiménez. He received the Nobel Prize for Literature, and I want to share with you the citation for that. This was back in 1956, and the citation reads, For his lyrical poetry, which in the Spanish language con constitutes an example of high spirit and artistic purity. There are three stages in the development of his poetry, and for that I'm going to borrow uh, critics' ideas. This is uh, my edition in a cátedra of his Antología Poética. I'll give you more information about this in a second. By uh, The edition is by Javier Blasco, and he speaks of three stages in Juan Ramón's poetry. And by the way, we, we do refer to him as Juan Ramón. Okay? Uh, he's one of those poets that you can drop the, the last name and it's perfectly all right. So from 1900, the year 1900 to 1913, uh, Blasco speaks of an ecstasy of love. So this is poetry that is, uh, it has the influence of Gustavo Adolfo Becker, who was a tremendously influential poet in the Spanish-speaking world, a late romantic, I would say. But there's also a little bit of the French symbolists in this early stage, and a light type of modernismo. Then we have a second stage in the development of Juan Ramón's poetry, which uh, Blasco describes as avidez de eternidad. I would translate that as a desire for eternity, or maybe as a thirst for eternity. And that covers the years 1914 to 1923. This is probably my favorite stage in the poetry of Juan Ramón. You can actually feel in this time period the fact that he had met his wife, Zenobia, who was a really, really important presence in his life, just changed his world view, you know, the way it should be, right, if you ask me. But this is a more, uh, it's, it's a happier time in his life and in his poetry, you know, there, there's more hope here. And he also encountered during this time the sea as an image, right? The sea is a recurring theme in Juan Ramón's poetry and it represents, of course, life. And then finally we have a third stage which Blasco calls a necesidad de conciencia interior. So basically we're talking about a need for an inner consciousness. In this last part what you have is mysticism, but it's a very personal type of mysticism. Okay, It's not like San Juan de la Cruz, even though many uh, critics have drawn parallels between the two poets, especially with Juan Ramón in this uh, third stage. But Juan Ramón's mysticism is something else. Okay, It's a different type of mysticism. Now, Platero y yo is without a doubt Juan Ramón's most famous book. Okay, It will probably always be his most famous book, and it definitely exemplifies his style, I would say, but that does not necessarily mean that it is his most representative book. Okay, So please keep that in mind. By all means, read Platero y Cho, but please uh, make sure to read something else by Juan Ramón Jiménez. If you read Spanish, there's just one thing that you have to do, just get this one. Okay, the Cátedra editions, as I always say, these are the best. This one is titled, once again, Antología Poética, and it covers basically his entire uh, body of poetry. Now, uh, are you ready for the connection? We're going to go early with this in the video. The connection, of course, I'm talking about the Borges connection right here. It's very interesting because in public, Borges always placed, uh, praised, I'm sorry, Juan Ramón Jiménez. Okay, he, he praised him highly, and what he liked about Juan Ramón's poetry was the fact that it did not deal with ideas, but as Borges said, it dealt with eternidades o constancias del alma humana. So eternities or constancies of the human soul. So what he was saying basically was that uh, Juan Ramón 
was a down-to-earth poet, okay, a poet who was in touch with the world around him, and Borges really admired and praised that. However, when we come to Borges in, in the private sphere of his life, that is a different story, my friends. There are records of conversations with Bioy Casares, and the thing with Juan Ramón is that Bioy Casares and Borges were constantly, or not constantly, but when they talked about him, they made fun of him like very, very disparaging. They even criticized uh, the awarding of the Nobel Prize to Juan Ramón Jiménez and uh, wh while they were at it, of Gabriela Mistral also. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was kind of disappointing to me to, to read about this because I always thought, you know, oh my gosh, I wish I had the chance to hear those conversations between Borges and Bioy. But then sometimes I'm like, you know, when I, I, I just heard that they had ripped Juan Ramón to shreds, I was like, I don't know, maybe I don't want to hear all those conversations, you know, but that's a different story. So anyway, let's look at Platero y Show. let's look at the contents a little bit. This is a very simple story, it's basically the story of a poet and his donkey, okay? Just as simple as that. And it is presented as a series of vignettes, as a series of estampas, as we call them in Spanish. So basically we have an episodic work right here. The subtitle of Platero y Yo, something that people often tend to forget, is Elegía Andalusa, so an Andalusian elegy. Please keep that in mind, okay? We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second, but it's the subtitle is really, really important. And there's a debate as to who is the protagonist of Platero y Yo, because you have those two characters, Platero and Yo, Juan Ramón Jiménez. Uh, some people say the protagonist is Juan Ramón Jiménez, the poet. Other people say it's the donkey, Platero. I personally would argue that the protagonist of this book is actually Moguer, the town where Juan Ramón Jiménez was born and the town where Platero y Yo takes place. So we really meet the local people, you know, in, in this novel. Uh, we hear about their customs, we hear about their joy and their misery, you know, this is really about the joy and the misery of life, to make reference to that title from uh, Franz Emil Silampère, the Finnish novelist. And basically what we have in this book is one year in the life of this town, from one spring to the next. Okay, so the seasons are very important here in Platero y Yo also. So for that reason, many uh, people have seen uh, maybe a type of mono no aguare in this idea of the passing of time and the melancholy that accompanies that, right? Now, big question. Is Platero y Yo a children's book? Because it has definitely been marketed as a children's book. I would say, like Gulliver's Travels, Platero y Yo is a children's book by accident, which is basically another way of saying that it's not really a children's book at all. What happened was that as Juan Ramón was working on this book, right, back in 1914, a publisher saw an opportunity in the children's book uh, market and he asked Juan Ramón to provide some of these episodes and they put together an edition of this book that was meant primarily for children. So there were some passages that were not kid-friendly exactly, so they took those out. And that was the edition of 1914. The complete book was published a few years later in 1917. Okay, so that is the complete edition that we have of Platero y Yo that, is, that was read by many people, you know, children and adults alike. So I want to explore a little bit the genre and the, and the themes of this work. And you have uh, two ways of reading this book. Basically, you can see it as a long episodic poem or a cycle of poems, right? But also you can read it, and I really like this, as a type of poetic novella because of its repetitive structure, which is very similar to the structure that you can usually find in the genre of the novella. There are many light motifs here, okay? Obviously we have the relationship between the poet and his donkey. We also have the rough beauty of Moguer, the town where it takes place. And for that reason it was that I was saying that maybe that is the protagonist of this book, but also human and misery. The main theme is death, if you ask me, okay? And that makes perfect sense because once again we are talking about an elegy. I would say that the descriptions that you find in Platero y Show are just among the most beautiful that you can find in the Spanish language, okay? I think uh, they are just uh, astonishing, you know? And one thing you're gonna wonder as you read this book is, are there actually people who experience or perceive the world this way? Like, is this really true? Is it really possible to experience the world around you the way the poet does in this book? And I would say yes, you know, a true poet would actually experience the world 
in, in this way. Um, just to share this with you, Juan Ramón Jiménez thought that the, um, the purpose of the poet, the idea of poetry was to descifrar el mundo cantándolo, so to decipher the world by singing it, or through singing it, or through song. So that tells you a lot about the, his approach, you know, and how he uh, produced a book like Platero y Sho. Let's look at the characters. Now, we have obviously two characters that are the main ones, right? We have the poet, Juan Ramón Jiménez, he calls himself that in the book, and then the donkey. So they are both outcasts, really. The poet is often perceived as a madman or a babbler, as, as Lord Byron said, by other people. And then a donkey, you know, is not exactly a, a kind of a noble animal, right? You can see that in the Bible. You, I mean, a donkey is not a horse, you know, a horse is a horse, of course, but, you know, this is completely, completely different animal that we have right here. And for that reason, the two of them just get along perfectly fine, okay? There's a, there's a quote that I want to share with you on how the poet perceives the donkey right here, and this is on page 52 of the edition uh, published by Dover. And at one point, and I'm going to share the, the quotes in Spanish, okay, I'll have a translation for you. The translations are going to be uh, just, you know, rough and pedestrian, but uh, just to give you a sense of the meaning of the text. Uh, so he says, Él comprende bien que lo quiero y no me guarda rencor. Es tan igual a mí, tan diferente a los demás, que he llegado a creer que sueña mis propios sueños. Now, of course, we only get the poet's story, right? We only get his side of the story. It would be really interesting to rewrite Platero y Shaw from the perspective of the donkey. That would be another story, right? I think it's really fun, you know, uh, to have a donkey here. I was thinking as I read it that there are two famous donkeys, in uh, at least two of them, in the history of Spanish literature. Uh, Sancho Panza's Rusio, of course, and then Platero y Shaw. Right. And speaking of donkeys, uh, you probably remember, if you have seen Luis Buñuel's uh, Un Chien Andalou, the, an Andalusian dog, remember those dead, rotting donkeys on top of the pianos? That is a reference to Platero y Sho, because uh, we understand that Luis Buñuel and Salvador Dalí actually hated this book. Of course they hated it, okay? They were surrealists, this was a beloved book at the time. It was just almost, you could say that it was their nature to, to hate. They were like genetically predisposed to hate Platero y Shaw. I think this is a great book, okay? I love Buñuel, I love Dalí, and I love Platero y Shaw, so it's just one of those things. Uh, let's not forget we have the characters, right? The poet, the donkey, but also the town, as I said before. We meet some gypsies. We meet uh, lots of kids in this book. There are children, so maybe that's one of the reasons why it could be marketed as a book for children. But many of these kids in the book are, are just uh, suffering from disease, you know, or maybe from mental health issues. So it's a, it's a very dark little book in many ways. And the notion or the idea that it conveys of Moguer is it's a very rough place for sure. Now, I want to pause a little bit on the figure of the poet. Okay, what kind of poet is he in the first place? This is the first question that I ask myself. He reminds me a little bit of the American transcendentalists, okay, and I see a little bit of the spirit here, if not the style, right, because the style is a little bit different, but I see a little bit of the spirit of Walt Whitman throughout this book. Now, I would say, if you asked me what is the main difference between, you know, the kind of worldview that is conveyed by Platero y Shaw and uh, Whitman, I would say that we are lacking here those celebratory outbursts that you often find in Whitman. This is kind of a melancholy book, and we have to remember that Juan Ramón was a rather melancholy person. Okay, one of his books, I believe, is titled Melancholia. So, you know, just, just to give you an idea, remember an Andalusian elegy. So we have this concept that keeps repeating itself. Juan Ramón, at one point in his life, suffered a breakdown that was precipitated primarily by the death of his father. And you could say that basically he, he never recovered, in a way. Okay, He had a period of happiness with, with his wife, for sure, but uh, he suffered from depression throughout his life. And that's something that you'll be able to tell if you want to psychoanalyze uh, the character of the poets in Platero y Shaw through the book. 
Now, because there is no plot here in Platero y Show, it's very difficult to talk about the contents of this book. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to mention and to share with you some chapters or some episodes that I found to be memorable. So that's basically what we're going to be doing right here. The first uh, episode is really famous. You know, like everybody recognizes the beginning of this book. Platero es pequeño, peludo, suave. Tan blando por fuera que se diría todo de algodón, que no lleva huesos. Solo los espejos de azabache de sus ojos son duros cual dos escarabajos de cristal negro. So you get already from that very beginning the beautiful poetry and the beautiful descriptions that you can find in this book. In many of these chapters you have a foreshadowing of death and that is the example of episode number 11. Okay? In this episode he is already thinking about where he is going to bury Platero. Tú, si te mueres antes que yo, no irás, platero mío, en el carrillo del pregonero, a la marisma inmensa, ni al barranco del camino de los montes como los otros pobres burros, como los caballos y los perros que no tienen quien los quiera. Vive tranquilo, platero. Yo te enterraré al pie del pino grande y redondo del huerto de la piña, que a ti tanto te gusta. Estarás al lado de la vida alegre y serena. Los niños jugarán y coserán las niñas en sus sillitas bajas a tu lado. Sabrás los versos que la soledad me traiga, oirás cantar a las muchachas cuando lavan en el naranjal, y el ruido de la noria será gozo y frescura de tu paz eterna, y todo el año los jilgueros, los chamarices y los verdones te pondrán en la salud perenne de la copa un breve techo de música entre tu sueño tranquilo y el infinito cielo de azul constante de Moguer. So once again, you know, you can feel that uh, that language, that beautiful poetic prose that uh, is the trademark of Juan Ramón Jiménez. Then you have, uh, I really liked episode number 15. That one was one of my favorites also because it is really melancholy. It is elegiac, if you want, and it's titled The Castrated Cold. Okay, so it's like a little bit tough to read for, for some of us, you know, and uh, I, I saw also that melancholy of Juan Ramón right there. I also noted uh, the episode number, let's see, my Roman numerals, I should have, you know, uh, reviewed these before, before this video. This would be 10, 15, 18. Okay, so number 18, La Fantasma, or The Ghost. This one is plot driven, okay, so some of them you can read as short stories. They are not entirely, uh, n not 100% descriptive all the time. It's a very sad story also. And then I have number 25, which is really exultant, you know, and shows you that not all is sad in this book. There are some elements and some moments of deep happiness, because this one, number 25, is titled Springtime, okay, La Primavera. So it's really about this outburst of life right here. So you do have like kind of like an, an interlacing of this happiness and uh, this misery. But I feel that misery is a little bit heavier in this book. That's why I always kind of underline that elegy of the subtitle. Then episode number, I really should have, you know, reviewed Roman numerals here. Episode number 42 is just a beautiful description, right? And it has a really striking last line right here. It's about a little kid, right? It's titled El Niño y el Agua, so the boy and the water. And basically what you have is this little kid just playing with the water. It's a very simple thing, the kind of thing that you can find in, in a rural area. But uh, it's what Juan Ramón does uh, or, or makes with these things, you know, that, that is just uh, astonishing and, and very memorable. So uh, this kid is playing with the water, right? Echado en el suelo, tiene la mano bajo el chorro vivo, y el agua le pone en la palma un tembloroso palacio de frescura y de gracia que sus ojos negros contemplan arrobados. Habla solo, sorbe su nariz, se rasca aquí y allá entre sus harapos con la otra mano. El palacio, igual siempre y renovado a cada instante, vacila a veces. Y el niño se recoge entonces, se aprieta, se sume en sí, para que ni ese latido de la sangre que cambia con un cristal movido solo, la imagen tan sensible de un calidoscopio, le robe al agua la sorprendida forma primera. Platero, no sé si entenderás o no lo que te digo, pero ese niño tiene en su mano mi alma. This is very deep, okay? It's, it just reaches those heights of poetry, you know? And you can see this in moments throughout the book. I'm just pointing out some of the ones that I uh, remembered and that I liked. And this one's easy, chapter or episode number 50. Uh, in this one, it's about a flower, okay? So he sees a flower, la flor del camino, okay? So the wayside flower. 
and he sees this flower in the roadside, right? And that kind of evokes just a, an entire meditation. It's a metaphysical meditation. So I think maybe that's what poetry is all about, you know, about finding the transcendent, about finding the divine in every single thing. And maybe that's what Juan Ramon was saying when he said, you know, the purpose of poetry is to just, you know, through song, to decipher the world around us. That's maybe something that's going on in this little episode right here. Then I also liked episode 51, which is a very nice portrait of a dog. The title is Lord, which is the name of the dog. So it's really nice, a really nice por portrait of, of this dog, but also very sad. Okay, so keep that in mind. That is kind of like a given always with this book. 108, okay, this one is brutal. La Chegua Blanca, okay, the white mare. It is about the killing of a mare. And as I said, you know, this one is just really sad and, and it shows you the violence of the type of life uh, that Juan Ramon is talking about. And then I also liked uh, episode number 111, which is, I, I read it this way, it's just a beautiful ode to fire. It's titled La Chama or The Flame and it's just, you know, let me read you a little bit of this one so that you can get an idea of what I am talking about. Tal vez no tenga la naturaleza muestra mejor que el fuego. La casa está cerrada y la noche fuera y sola. Y sin embargo, cuanto más cerca que el campo mismo estamos, Platero, de la naturaleza, en esta ventana abierta del antro plutónico. El fuego es el universo dentro de casa. Colorado e interminable, como la sangre de una herida del cuerpo, nos calienta y nos da hierro, con todas las memorias de la sangre. Todas las formas surgen de él, en infinito encanto, ramas y pájaros, el león y el agua, el monte y la rosa. Mira, nosotros mismos sin quererlo, bailamos en la pared, en el suelo, en el techo. ¡Qué locura, qué embriaguez, qué gloria! El mismo amor parece muerte aquí, Platero. And before I leave you, uh, I wanted to point out that there is uh, another connection. So we talked about the Borges connection. There is also the Kutsia connection, believe it or not. Very interesting, right? Uh, J.M. Kutsia actually wrote an introduction to a Mexican edition of Platero y Show. It's a very brief essay, but basically the most important insight that I got from it was Kutsia's ideas and thoughts about the importance of the gaze in this book. Okay, it's all about the how the poet and the donkey look at each other, how they share this gaze right here. Besides the ever-present gaze of the child, there is a second and more obvious gaze in the book, the gaze of Platero himself. And then he says, it is the mutual gaze between the eyes of this man and the eyes of his donkey that establishes the deep bond between them in much the same way that a bond is established between mother and infant at the moment when their gazes first lock. So in this very brief introduction he really uh, gives us great insight into that and it is really one of the themes that you can see present in the book. Let's look at the bottom line here. I think Platero y Show is a classic and it deserves to be. Okay, I'm gonna say that. I really love this book. Many people will consider it cliche, you know, because everybody loved it back in the day, but I think it's really a wonderful book. I would say read it for the descriptions and just uh, the exquisite prose poetry. You know, it's, it's just one of the best examples of po prose poetry that we have in Spanish. The translation, by the way, is by Stanley Applebaum in this edition from Dover. It's a dual language edition, so it's really good because you can follow the original. And I looked at it as I read the Spanish text, and in some places, you know, I, I looked on on purpose, I was like, whoa, this is a tricky part right here. I wonder if they got it right in the translation. And all the time, they, the translator had actually gotten it right. So this is an excellent version of Platero y Show, whether you read it in the Spanish original or in English. But once again, I would say, please make sure after you experience this book to read something else by Juan Ramón Jiménez. His book, Diario de un Poeta Recién Casado, Diary of a Newly Wed Poet, and the other book that, that is great, another one of my favorites, is Eternidades. Okay, and before we finish, I wanted to leave you with uh, a poem by Juan Ramón from precisely that book, Diario de un Poeta Recién Casado. It's a very brief poem, but it will give you an idea of what his poetry is like outside of Platero y Show. So listen to this. The title is Cielo. Te tenía olvidado, cielo, y no eras más que un vago existir de luz, visto sin nombre por mis cansados ojos indolentes y aparecías entre las palabras perezosas y desesperanzadas del viajero, 
como en breves lagunas repetidas de un paisaje de agua visto en sueños. Hoy te he mirado lentamente y te has ido elevando hasta tu nombre. Do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? I'm all ears, okay, just like Platero. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.